So you've, you've heard for the last several days about all kinds of sustainable energy technologies, and I want to um, give you maybe a, a somewhat related but different um, take on it. So we like to think about all of the various devices we can use in sustainable energy. <coughs> These are some of the common ones. So we have uh, photovoltaics, things like supercapacitors, batteries. If we want to take sunlight and directly make fuels, we might use something like a photoelectrochemical cell. Um, we can generate things like hydrogen, which we can store. We might later want to turn that back into electricity, so we would use something like a fuel cell. Uh, the reason I put this slide up is if you look at all of these technologies today, they already involve many, many nanomaterials, nanoscale materials. So all of these components um, of things like photovoltaics or supercapacitors, if you uh, look at a lot of the materials there at a very small scale, and I think going forward, we're going to be able to do more and more powerful things, get better energy conversion efficiencies by exploiting some of the properties at the nanoscale. So that's why uh, we look at nanoscale materials. You've been hearing a lot about energy. I told you at the Tomcat Center, to tie back into that for a minute, we're interested in interconnections and other global challenges. So besides energy, there are challenges in human health, water, food, et cetera. And these are some opportunities that are, are coming up the pike. Um, these also will benefit in many ways, uh, most of them, from materials at the nano scale. So I like to think about those global problems having very small solutions. And of course, you're probably all familiar with uh, what nano scale materials mean, but we're basically talking about things that are uh, 10 to the minus 9 meters in uh, size on average. One thing that's interesting about working with nanomaterials is it often takes really big macro devices to, um, or equipment to monitor them. So we have lots of big machinery. The smaller the material, the bigger and more complicated the machinery, the apparatus usually is. So these are just some um, uh, chambers and experimental apparatus in my own lab, some of my students. So we often have lots of uh, big uh, devices to both make the materials, and I'll tell you about one of the techniques we use to make nanoscale materials, and then to monitor what we have. We have to use a lot of um, spectroscopies involving photons and electrons uh, to be able to see, um, and microscopies to be able to see what we've made. So I'm going to actually talk about two vignettes or two examples of applying nanoscale materials to energy conversion um, systems that my lab works on. I'm going to start off with solar cells and then I'm going to give you an example of using nanoscale materials and catalysis. So I know you heard, I think, from Professor Mike McGee yesterday or the day before um, talking about solar cells. We work with Mike, um, and I'm going to tell you about one of the things uh, we've done looking at perovskite solar cells. So it's hard to be um, involved in any research at all in solar cells without having heard about perovskite. So it, we like to show various efficiency plots when you look at photovoltaics versus year. And if you look at most technologies, it may be a little hard to read this, but this, these black dots are silicon, crystalline silicon technologies. They're all going up. That's the first thing to notice. But generally, over the last couple of decades, they've gone up pretty slowly. So here's silicon. It's creeping up 1 or 2 percentage over those decades. Here are other thin film materials. And then there's this red curve here, which is a new material, or relatively new. It's just over the last, say, seven years, uh, has gone up from just a, sort of a niche material with a few percent efficiency to being competitive with, uh, almost with crystal and silicon here above 22 percent. So the current record using these uh, lead halide perovskites is over 20 2%. Um, silicon still is great. It's really, really hard to compete with silicon because it's also efficient um, and it's relatively inexpensive. But what's nice about these perovskite materials is you can make them from solution. You can spin them onto some um, substrate and anneal them and you can get good solar cell material. So they're solution processable. And you can tune the band gap over a wide range. And that makes it useful for things like tandem solar cells, which I'm going to mention. So uh, tandem solar cells are a good way to raise the efficiency compared to just your standard single junction solar cell, which involves typically a PN junction of semiconductor materials. And uh, you can get really high efficiency. So if you use things that are extremely high quality materials, like uh, gallium arsenide, for example, uh, and you stack a bunch of these together, um, they uh, can be about 46% efficient. But they're really, really expensive. So a square meter of this kind of stack of a solar cell costs about uh, $40,000.
Okay, so this is really useful for things like space applications, satellites, but not going to be on our rooftops anytime soon. On the other hand, uh, you can calculate that if you take uh, a basic silicon solar cell, which is the predominant technology um, in, in the world right now, and you put on top of that one of these perovskites. Remember I said you can kind of spin those on, so you might be able to do that pretty cheaply on top of an existing solar cell. You can get not as high an efficiency as something like a, a compound semiconductor like this one, but still quite a good boost, and you can do it really cheaply. Okay, so that's kind of the, the goal of what we're looking at. It turns out, though, to stack materials like this requires lots of control over every layer in, in a device. So the challenges with making uh, solar cell tandems using this new perovskite material is that you need to have various layers, including this one here, which has to be transparent because you're going to let the light all the way through to get to both, uh, reach both cells in here, the silicon and the perovskite cell. Um, and it needs to be very much protective. It has to have good electrical properties, but also impart um, stability because these perovskites, the, the the dirty little secret about perovskites is they have great efficiency, but they're horribly unstable. They degrade in, in moisture, uh, with temperature, and, and any sort of um, active reactive species. So we want to be able to protect them. So we came into this problem uh, saying, well, we think we have a technique for putting down a material here which will be gentle and protect the perovskite, have very good electrical properties, and allow us to then do other layers on top of it with more reactive um, deposition techniques. And we use this with a, uh, we use a technique called atomic layer deposition, which we can do at relatively low temperature and put down really interesting electronic materials. So if you look at the stack here, uh, lots of different materials. These are all relatively thin. The proskite itself is 500 nanometers, roughly. We have these various layers here. And we're looking here, a few nanometers of this material, which we're going to put down by atomic layer deposition, and then continue the rest of the stack with more conventional techniques. So, uh, atomic layer deposition is called ALD uh, for short. It's basically a technique that um, was developed 30 or 40 years ago for use in uh, large-scale displays, flat panel displays, and over the last decade or two has been widely adopted by the semiconductor industry. So it's used for um, lots of microelectronics. Probably every chip in every computer now has um, ALD in some part of its fabrication, probably multiple parts. But what the technique is, is it uses a vacuum system and you pulse in various reactants in the gas phase. So you pulse in a reactant gas and it'll react at your surface. Um, it undergoes a, a thermal reaction, but it's self-limiting. So it won't react to more than one layer. Okay, this is the key part of this technique. Then you come in with another precursor that also will react just to one layer, it saturates. And if you put both of these precursors in, you get one atomic layer of whatever material you're interested in, ideally. And then you repeat this multiple times, and you can grow a film as thick as you want. Um, you typically are growing on the order of one angstrom, or a tenth of a nanometer per cycle. So it's a very slow process. Not at all useful if you're trying to grow thick films. But when you're trying to grow films that are only a few nanometers, it's actually a great technique. And that's why it's used so widely in microelectronics, where everything is really small also very thin in these solar cells. So these are just some examples of materials that have been grown by ALD. This is an example. Uh, a few years ago, my group took a silicon nanowire from each Hui's group, and we coated it with platinum by ALD. And you can see by this image, the platinum is uniformly coating everywhere around it. So it has this nice feature of being able to make thin films that conformally coat all kinds of um, complex structures. OK. so we. Um, we have techniques for growing all kinds of materials. This is just to show you the types of gases that we have to flow in. They're these metal organic precursors. They react with things like water. And um, we found that zinc oxide and tin oxide together make a really good electrical layer for these perovskite solar cells. So we, we can grow them using these precursors at temperatures around 150 degrees C, so relatively low. I'm going to skip that. So I mentioned that the perovskites are very sensitive to degradation. And one of the very first things we had to check is how we can run this process to grow tin oxide or zinc doped tin oxide on top of the perovskite without degrading the perovskite. So my student, Axel Palmstrom, who ran most of these experiments, tried all kinds of conditions and all kinds of temperatures. And one of the things about the perovskites, were, these are x-ray diffraction images. 
Uh, they are crystalline, so you see these peaks here with the dashed lines that come from the perovskite. And as it starts to degrade, you get a very clear signature and x-ray diffraction of lead iodide, which is one of the degradation products. So it's kind of hard to miss. So when your perovskite starts to degrade, you start to see this very strong perov uh, lead iodide peak. So you can see that depending on the conditions of growing this ALD film on top of the perovskite, some of them are great. They maintain the perovskite, and other ones we start to degrade it into lead iodide. So we modified uh, the process to be able to gently deposit the material. Um, and then what we did is we put this on a stack. So we had an underlying silicon solar cell that actually was um, uh, contributed by a group, part of this big collaboration at Arizona State, uh, Zach Holman's group. And uh, then the McGee group helped put perovskite down, and we did some of these other layers. And so this many, many complex layers all went together. And right in here is this ALD layer that gently goes down on the perovskite and allows us to do the next steps. And what we found is it worked really, really well. So we were able to make this tandem, silicon perovskite tandem, with efficiencies of about 23.6% and very stable. Okay, that's the key thing. Can you keep the efficiency uh, for long periods of time. And we showed that these were very stable because this very thin film helps encapsulate the perovskite and protect it. We also looked at uh, making perovskite tandems just out of perovskite. So this is a perovskite-perovskite tandem where we stack one perovskite of one band gap and another perovskite of another band gap together. And again, many layers have to go into this. And I'll just point out a lot of them involve ALD. So that's where we put our ALD layers. Uh, we choose these of different band gaps so we can collect more of the solar spectrum. And depending on how you wire this up, you can do a two terminal or a four terminal uh, structure, we can get efficiencies above 20%. And the nice thing about being able to make a pure perovskite tandem uh, is that these can now be flexible because silicon solar cells are typically crystalline or polycrystalline and they're not particularly flexible unless you make them ultra thin like Daniel was referring to. Okay, so. This is just an example of taking a thin film of about a few nanometers and completely uh, changing and improving the electrical properties of a solar cell um, that was very effective. I want to turn to the second example, which is catalyst. So very different type of uh, system, um, but also takes advantage of nanoscale material. So I want to give a little bit of background on catalysis. I think you probably also heard from Tom, Professor Tom Jaramillo about catalysis and electrocatalysis on an earlier day. We collaborate with his group as well. Um, incredibly important. So more than 80% of all industrial chemical processes use some catalytic step, probably multiple catalytic steps. What I mean by industrial processes is everything from pharmaceuticals to plastics to petroleum. So it's huge. Um, catalysts themselves are big business. So the sales of catalysts is about $15 billion a year. But if you project out the annual value of products that were manufactured with catalysts, it's about a trillion dollars. Okay, so incredibly important uh, set of materials. Just so that everybody remembers their high school chemistry, a catalyst is something that alters the rate of reaction without itself being consumed. If you went on and learned more about that later, you probably learned that that's a, an oversimplification, as with most things. Um, but uh, the way it actually works is it takes a, um, you know, set of reactants and set of products, and it comes up with an alternative mechanism, molecular mechanism for the reactants to get to the products that basically takes less energy, has a lower barrier so it's faster. So that's basically what a catalyst is doing on the molecular level. And we're very interested in catalysts. So I, I started off, the title of my talk is Nanomaterials or Nanotech for Sustainable Energy or something like that. Nanotechnology and nanomaterials have been around for a really long time. Catalyst is an old field. The Haber-Bosch uh, catalyst, which converts uh, nitrogen into ammonia, an incredibly industrial important process, celebrated its 100-year anniversary you know, a few years ago. And that is made up of nanoscale materials. Okay? So this is nothing new. We've just come up with really interesting ways of making nanoscale materials and characterizing them. Um, that we didn't have um, many decades ago, but, but it's been around for a while, especially in catalysis. So catalysts tend to be really complicated structures generally, especially commercial catalysts. Um, in heterogeneous catalysts of the type I'm talking about, the 
chemistry, the way that the catalyst speeds up the reaction, it only takes place on the outer surface of it. So you can have a great catalyst and make a big sphere of it, and, and the whole inner part of that's useless. So what people do with catalysts is they try to break it up into lots of little particles, nano-sized particles, so that they have a lot of surface area, because that's the part that does the catalytic conversion. So they tend to have all kinds of complex structures. Okay. So what catalytic system am I going to tell you about? There are lots of many, many, many important catalytic reactions. I'm going to talk about a, um, a cycle here that is a carbon neutral fuel production. Okay. So if you imagine a car, you have your internal combustion engine. It's, it's um, combusting something like ethanol or some other fuel. It generates carbon dioxide. Okay. Plants can take carbon dioxide and turn that into biomass. Biomass can uh, be turned into something called synthesis gas through a gasification process, which is uh, well known. So this is carbon monoxide and hydrogen, and it's called synthesis gas, syngas, because it can be used to then synthesize lots of other interesting materials or uh, chemicals. So if we had a catalyst that can take this and convert it back into, say, ethanol or the fuel, then we would have this carbon neutral fuel production. The problem is we, we certainly know how to do this step, and this step happens naturally. Uh, this one we know how to do, but there really aren't great catalysts for going from synthesis gas to good uh, fuels. And so that's what the focus is of, of the project I'm going to tell you about. Um, what we want to do is take the carbon and waste in the form of CO2 and convert it to valuable fuels and also chemicals. And the, the product or type of products that's useful for this are what we call higher oxygenate. So ethanol is one of these higher oxygenates. It means it has more than two carbons in the molecule and it has some form of oxygen in there. Okay, so butanol or acetaldehyde, there are lots of um, different molecules. They're nice because they're liquids. Um, they can be used as clean transportation fuels and they're very useful as a feedstock for manufacturing other important uh, chemicals. But as I mentioned, we don't really have a good effective catalyst for this. Okay. And here's one of the problems. Um, we take something simple like carbon monoxide and hydrogen, just these two small molecules. And we want to go this way. We want to form these higher oxygenates. But you can see by the arrows here, there are a lot of competing reactions. This is always the problem with catalysis. You have to have selectivity for the product you want and not make all the byproducts that you're not interested in. So we can get um, just hydrocarbons through a well-known process called Fischer-Tropsch. We could hydrogenate too early, and then we get methanol, which is too short. Or we can do what I think is the worst possibility, go back to carbon dioxide, which we don't want to do. Okay, so this is what we're trying to generate um, catalysts for. And we're, we benefit greatly from the fact that here at Stanford, we have a big theoretical effort um, directed by Jens Norskov, who can take reactions like this and they can calculate for lots of potential metals or uh, metal alloys or other systems, what might lead to the product we want. Okay, so they come up with plots like this and I can see you, it's too hard to see it here. You, they have different metals listed on here. So as a starting point, we can go into one of those metals and say, let's start with that and try to synthesize that catalyst and see if we can make a lot of things like ethanol. Okay. So if you were able to see that plot, you would have seen that rhodium was one of the interesting materials on it. Um, and it's also been shown in the literature that rhodium is a pretty good catalyst for converting syngas to higher um, alcohols or other oxygenates. And again, like I mentioned, the way these work is we, we try to take rhodium, which is very expensive, precious metal, and we try to disperse it in very small, fine particles inside a, a powder so that we maximize the surface area. So it's sitting on a powder, usually made up of something like silicon dioxide, sometimes alumina or titania. Um, and so this is called the support we pack a bunch of that powder into a reactor and you flow the gas through and out comes your products in an ideal system. Okay. One thing we know about uh, what are called supported metal catalysts like this is that the metal oxide that they're sitting on plays a huge role in what products you make. Okay, so it's not just some inert thing sitting around that doesn't have an effect and everything's happening on the rhodium. It turns out this is really important too. Um, this material sometimes uh, sits on top of the rhodium, and in that case, we call it a promoter. It's something that promotes um, production of the molecule of interest. Okay. So for example, we can take the standard uh, rhodium on silica, or we can put the rhodium on some other metal oxide, 
and we would find probably that they reacted completely differently. Or we could take that same metal oxide and put it all around the rhodium, um, and this we would call a promoter, and we might get a completely different product. So we were very interested in using some of our synthesis strategies to be able to put down small amounts of material to see whether one metal oxide had an effect on the rhodium different from another and why it um, controlled the products the way it did. So we can um, use our technique of atomic layer deposition, which I like to say we've stolen from the semiconductor industry and applied to lots of other problems, to take um, a catalyst that we synthesize through conventional methods. These are usually just solution methods where you take a powder and you shove a lot of metal salt in it and it dries and leaves you the metal particles. Um, but we could also try to change out the metal oxide support and, and the promoter. And we do that by um, coming in and taking our support and adding some other metal oxide on it, a very, very thin layer, maybe one or two atomic layers thick, and then putting down the catalyst or doing it on top of the catalyst so we can get all of these different types of structures to try to understand the interplay between the metal oxide and the catalyst. Okay, so I mentioned we use our atomic layer deposition method again. Uh, the first metal oxide we looked at for this rhodium system was manganese oxide. So here's our molecule that we use with water to grow it. And uh, we looked at three configurations. One is the standard catalyst. One is the catalyst where uh, we actually took the silica, we grew a very thin layer of manganese oxide, and then we put down the rhodium. And one where we first put down the rhodium, and then we grew a little layer of manganese oxide on top of that. So this is like an overcoat, and that's part of the support. Uh, we can look at uh, this, all kinds of characterization of the catalyst. You can see that these are all very small. So the catalysts themselves, this is a particle size distribution. They're on the order of two or three nanometers. So the rhodium is a really teeny particle here, but it's being strongly influenced by this metal oxide that's sitting next to it. And we take all these catalysts that we synthesize with slightly different structure, and we stick them into this packed bed reactor, and we look at the product distribution that we get. And, and that's what I'm showing here. So this is the standard catalyst, rhodium on silica. And I'm showing uh, uh, several pieces of information here. So these are the selectivity. So here in gray, the size of this bar is how much methane out of 100% that we're forming. The green is higher um, hydrocarbon, so we don't really care about either of those. This little blue line is methanol, and the orange is what we want. Okay, those are the higher oxygenates. So it does okay. The standard rhodium catalyst does okay. It makes a fair amount of these, by maybe 20%. And this number on top is the overall activity. So how much of the carbon monoxide and hydrogen do you put in gets converted to any sort of product? That's this number up here. Um, these three bars on the right are when we add some manganese oxide to it. And the first thing you can see is the number goes up here, so we're making more product of all types. Um, and happily, we're getting more of the product we want, which is the orange bar, these higher oxygenates. But it actually matters where we put down the manganese. If we put it on the bottom versus the top, these are the two middle bars, there's a different selectivity pattern. And that's interesting to us on a fundamental level. So we do things like spectroscopy where we go in um, with infrared light and we can actually detect um, how carbon monoxide is bonding to the rhodium. We can see this by a spectroscopic signature and we can correlate the products with um, how many of the uh, higher, so we can correlate the species here at the surface with how much higher oxygenate um, production we get. And then we can connect that with theory, which is, again is done by the Norskov group, which can calculate uh, why manganese would have the effect that it does on the product distribution that we see. So this all um, tells us that manganese oxide is a pretty good promoter. It helps form more of the product that we want and makes the catalyst more active. Um, we can also extend, extend this, and we did, to a bunch of different metal oxides. So now that we have this technique of saying we can, we can tweak uh, in a very controlled way a supported metal uh, catalyst, uh, we can start to look at other metal support interactions. So we looked at this comparison of titania, alumina, and silica. If you look in the literature, um, there have been all kinds of reports that you get different activity and different selectivity with rhodium depending on the different supports. But we suspected that what was happening is when people do standard synthetic techniques with these different supports, they change a lot about the system. They change the size of the particles, the size of the pores, and they're not having a controlled experiment. So we felt we could do a controlled experiment 
um, and get rid of those structural effects and just uh, explore the different chemical properties of these supports by using this fine atomic layer deposition technique. And so that's what we did here. Um, this is how we grow little layers of titania. This is how we grow little layers of alumina. And um, we can compare that. Everything looks the same structurally. This is the particle size distribution. They're spot on, the same rhodium distribution, independent of these different um, metal oxides. And interestingly, when we then made all the catalysts and studied them, we found that contrary to the literature, they really didn't vary that much. Okay? So the selectivity didn't change that much. You could just tell that by sort of the size of the various bars. There's some changes, but not anything huge. Um, consistent with our theory that this was really about structure, all the literature reports, but chemically they didn't differ that much. Um, let me sum up here, so I have a little bit of time to let you take a breather or answer any questions. I try to give you two examples of where nanomaterials play an important role in energy conversion um, or catalytic conversion. Uh, I, I like to think atomic layer deposition is a powerful technique for controlled synthesis of nanomaterials. It's one of many interesting techniques for doing that. Um, we applied it to solar cells, so we were looking at these tandem perovskite solar cells, and we also applied it to heterogeneous catalysis where we do what we uh, consider sort of a rational design of catalysts to really try to, one, make better catalysts, and two, understand fundamentally what's happening in them. Uh, lots of uh, students and collaborators to thank. So I mentioned Axel Palmstrom uh, led in my group the perovskite tandem work. We collaborated with Mike McGee's group and Zach Holman's group at ASU and, and their students. And uh, three of my students uh, worked on the syngas catalysis, Noya Young, Joseph Singh, and Aruna Sundi, and we collaborated with Jens Norskov. Uh, thank you for your attention, and I'd be happy to take a couple of questions. So you mentioned that atomic layer deposition is a little limited and that it's really slow and takes a lot of time. What's like the thickest reasonable layer you can make using a method? I think people could probably, I mean, hundreds of nanometers is pretty reasonable. So um, one thing I didn't mention is people are looking at ways to do rapid processing through ALD. So there's a whole push to engineer fast systems. Uh, and large-scale systems. So, for example, for solar applications, you, you might need to do a really large area, and you typically don't want to build a vacuum system quite that big, although they do for sputter deposition. So they're developing um, things, uh, ALD systems, that can actually be done roll-to-roll -roll in atmosphere. Okay, so as they develop those, I think that, that number I'm giving you of a few hundred nanometers will increase, but for now, that's kind of a reasonable amount. Yeah. That would take my group forever to do a few hundred nanometers, because ours is a slow, home-built system. It's pretty slow. Can you, in, in, the, in either of these areas, in Roscoe or in yes. um, in what sense could part of it is, you know, still on the Edisonian approach of, you know, sample, 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 and what areas are, are more, you know, directed materials design or, you know, being, uh, you know, guided by things like the universe? Yeah, so I would say that um, photovoltaics in general is more Edisonian. I mean, it's, there's such an art to knowing what layer works and what, and there are just a ton of people trying tons of different things to get the right, you know, the best efficiency. Um, the catalysis has historically been very Edisonian, very empirical, but the nice thing about having the theory experiment collaboration is that we are working, uh, before we even go into the lab, with advanced knowledge of what might work, um, and there's usually quite good correlation between theory and experiment. And if there's not, then the theorists go back or the experimentalists go back, and so that works well. So I would say that's where we're really trying to take kind of a um, educated uh, information before we go and try to make something. And hopefully that will translate eventually to things like photovoltaics too, but currently that's a, there's a lot of art to that. On the issue of support, is, is that more? Uh, it, it has been, it has been, but again, the Norskov group and Suncat has been working on now looking at um, calculating the effects of various supports. So they are now also able to predict those effects as well. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so you have several collaborations with other research groups. Uh, how did those come about and how do you deal with splitting the work and uh, the task between the two groups? Uh, they usually, they often come about because of students. So students will say, oh, I'm working on something and 
gee, I'd really like to you know, go over to use um, something in the McGee lab, or I really need some theory. And so it's often through students that these collaborations occur. Um, sometimes it's kind of top down because we're writing a grant proposal together or something. Uh, there's almost never a problem with splitting the work because usually people, students will bring different expertise to a collaboration and uh, they will each contribute what their own skill set is. Um, and they can work very closely together. So for example, Axel and Kevin worked um, very, very closely on those perovskite cells, but they worked on different parts of it even though they watched each other do you know, the full assembly of it. So I think it usually works out quite naturally. Yeah. Are there any groups working on catalysts that are interested in like studying how plants and bacteria catalyze the induction of carbon dioxide, for example, carbon monoxide? See if you can get some explanation for that. Yeah, I mean, there are different aspects of that. There's sort of the bio-inspired design, which I think was the last part of what you asked. And, and a lot of what we are trying to do, um, I didn't mention this, but maybe Tom Jaramillo did. There's like a trying to artificially do nitrogen reduction. And we're inspired very much by nitrogenase and sort of the biomimetic uh, aspect of it. Um, I think there probably are some people doing the direct biological system you know, um, enzymatic catalysis at Stanford, but I'm less familiar with that work. There's probably a bigger effort on the kind of inorganic synthetic um, that's inspired by biology, but not actually using the biology. Okay. So you mentioned that perovskite layer is a little fragile based on, is it due to uh, like energy? Um, why can't you use it? Um, yeah, those, um, even these precursors that we use that aren't plasma excited, they're so reactive that if, if um, you don't do it right, they'll get in there and just react chemically with the perovskite. The perovskites are pretty complicated materials. I mean, they have a lot of um, organic parts and organic parts, and they'll get in there and react. So the problem with plasmas or other energetic things is, those ions or radicals will just react with them and convert it to something else which doesn't act like a perovskite. Yeah. Okay, let's thank uh, Professor Ben.